All right, Romans chapter 9. There's several chapters Paul keeps developing and unpeeling this uh, onion. Just keep peeling back the layers of uh, concerning Jews and Gentiles. Which I, Paul's making the point, which I've just put it simply before. God don't care if you're a literal DNA descendant of Abraham or not. It's by grace through faith now if you're a child of Abraham, and that's kind of the point that Paul's making here. Uh, Romans 9, chapter one, or verse 1, I say the truth in Christ. I lie not. It's kind of funny the apostle says, I'm telling you the truth, I'm not lying. <laughs> My conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost. You've heard that say, let your conscience be a guide? Kenny and I used to have a friend said that all the time. Let your conscience be a guide. <laughs> well, as a, as a Christian, we'll say, well, let the Holy Ghost be a guide. But here in this verse, we see there's a fine line between your conscience and the Holy Ghost. Because as a Christian, your conscience ought to be shaped by the Bible, the Word of God, the Word of the Holy Ghost, if you would. And the Holy Ghost dwells in our hearts by faith, but our conscience are working together to convict us of right and wrong, right? And uh, sometimes even we can have a, a misguided idea of what right and wrong is, and our conscience can be redeveloped, right? In other words, you think something's okay, and then somebody shows you something in the Scripture, and, oh, that's wrong. So then you realize, oh, I was wrong about that, and then your conscience gets reshaped because it's shaped by, thus saith the Lord, and His Spirit of God dwelling in our hearts by faith. Convicting us is what we call that. <clears throat> but I'm lying not. My conscience in the Holy Ghost bear me witness, verse 2, that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart. And you say, well, man, here's Paul. He said, I'm a man of constant sorrow. Well, I would have thought he'd been filled with joy too, right? Well, he can be, right? You can, have, you, can, you can be a Christian. Your heart be filled with joy, but you can also have sorrow over sin and sorrow over family members and lost people that you know that you that you know you're sorry about that but don't kill your joy at the same time we're not one dimensional i think paul's like that and paul had a constant sorrow when he thought about his relatives the jewish people i've got great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart for i could wish I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brother. If, 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 I could, to save, if I could die to save them all. You can't, Paul. Jesus did, though. If, if I, I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my, my kinsmen according to the flesh. If you've got lost family members, you can identify with what Paul's saying here. My kinsmen, according to the flesh, are the, the Jewish people, the, not, not the Jewish Christians. He was fine with them, right? But the Jewish people that had rejected Christ is who he's talking about, who are Israelites. And then he's going to give us a big list of bullet points about the favor that the Israelites had had with God in the past, to, to whom pertaineth the adoption. They're, they're the people that God chose to be a peculiar family of. He said in the Old Testament, of all the nations, of all the families on the earth. Only you have I known in that special way when he called out Abraham and his descendants. They were the, the nation that was adopted to be the people of God. And the glory, they were the ones that had the Shekinah glory dwelling in their midst, we read back in the Pentateuch. And, and the covenants were first given to them. And the giving of the law came to the, through the Jewish people. See, we, we owe a lot to the Jewish people too. All these things are handed down through the Jews to us. And the service of God, they were the ones called to do service in the tabernacle and the temple. And the promises were first made to them. And whose are the fathers or the forefathers that we read about? The patriarchs. And of whom as concerning the flesh, he as concerning the flesh is the key word here. He's talking about biological Jewish people. Of whom concerning the flesh Christ came. There's... It's ridiculous to me that sometimes I hear folks say that uh, Christians are anti-Semitists. You know, like, that's crazy. You know, we, we worship Jesus Christ, who was a Jew. You know, we're not anti-Semites. We, we can be thankful that Christ, he came through the, through the line from the Jews. His mom and daddy, well, his mama was Jewish. His daddy was God. Joseph was, God, was Jewish. Concerning the flesh, Christ came. 
And just like a byline here, a couple of things about Christ. He's over all. He's God. He's blessed forever. Amen. Verse 6, but not as though as the word of God had taken none effect, for they're not all Israel which are of Israel. Now, this is really complicated stuff. They're not all Israel which are of Israel. And it's prefaced with this, not as though the word of God had none effect. Much of the first century Jewish people had rejected Christ. Now, all the first century, all the first century church early on was Jewish, so not all Jews did. But many of the Orthodox, we call them Orthodox Jews today that still reject Christ. And he said, but it's not like the word of God didn't have any effect because God, in a sense, it's like he replaced them. That wasn't the plan. It was always for the whole world. But all these Jews that rejected him, but guess what? God, through the word, called the Gentiles in too. They're not all Israel, which are of Israel. Remember all the way back to chapter 2? He's not a Jew, which is one outwardly. He's a Jew, which is one inwardly, Romans 2, 28 and 29, that by grace through faith we become the people of God, Jewish people if you would, we're Christians, but we become the people of God. There's still Christians today that believe Israel over there in the Middle East, there, there's God's chosen people. No, they're not. You look at the church on every corner that worship Jesus. There's the chosen people of God. And they're not all Israel, which are of Israel, but the church became the, the spiritual Israel is the term. Verse 7, following the same thought, neither because they're the seed of Abraham, or not just because they're descendants of Abraham, are they all children. Because if they rejected the gospel, they're not children of God. I'll take it a step farther. Jesus told some of the Jews in John chapter 8, who rejected him? Verse 44. They thought they were they were bragging about they were descendants of Moses and therefore children of God. And he said, You are of your father, the devil. And you do like he does. He went on to tell. Them. So it has nothing to do with your genealogy in the flesh. They're not all Israel, which are the Israel, neither because they're the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall thy seed be called. Even in the Old Testament, not everybody that was a descendant of Abraham was considered God's chosen people, were they? I mean, very own. They was Abraham had Isaac, he had Esau. Uh, Jacob and Esau. Isaac and who's the other one? Ishmael, thank you. Isaac and Ishmael. Ishmael wasn't considered the line of Abraham. Next generation is Jacob and Esau. We're going to talk about them in this chapter. Esau's line's rejected. In Isaac, the seed that the children of God are going to come. This is the people of the Old Covenant. So Paul's using that Old Testament as an illustration that, hey, don't think that just because you're a descendant of Abraham that you're in. Verse 8, that is, they which are the children of the flesh, or genealogical Jews, these are not the children of God. That's not what makes you a child of God. But, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. And the promise that God made to Abraham is that all the families of the earth are going to be blessed through you. And you know you're part of the children of the promise when you believe the gospel of Jesus Christ. Then you're positionally this thought's going to go on for several chapters. We'll get over to chapter 11, getting ahead of myself two weeks here. But Paul's going to make an illustration of a tree. And he said, the Gentiles, you know what grafting a limb into a tree is? That's in Romans chapter 11. He said, the Jewish people were like a tree, and the Gentiles were grafted in. We become part of the same tree, Christians and Jews, as long as we believe in Jesus Christ. The ones that rejected Christ, he said, God broke those branches off, whether they were Jewish or not. They which are the children of the flesh, these are not children of God, but the children of the promise are counted for the seed. Verse 9, for this is the word of promise. And he's going to be quoting back from Genesis all through here on us. <clears throat> At this time will I come and Sarah will have a son. That was the prophecy to Sarah and Abraham. 
And not only this, but when Rebecca also had conceived by one, Abraham's daughter-in-law was Rebecca, right? Next generation. And when she had conceived, even by her father Isaac, for the children not yet being born. Now, Paul's doing Bible study right here. He's taking you back to Genesis. It said, before them boys was even born, Jacob and Esau, the twins, but not identical. (laughs) For the children being not yet born, neither even having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God, according to election, might stand not of works, but him that calleth. It was said unto her, the elder will serve the younger. And Paul's making the point that God said that before the boys was even born. That the elder will serve the younger when, no, when in normal circumstances it was the other way around, right? The firstborn. But this time the elder will serve the, serve the younger. And as it is written, here's a quote from the Old Testament now. Now, we can debate whether we're talking about foreknowledge of God or sovereignty here, but I think it's a little bit all mixed up together here, that it's it's God that calls. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. You say, I thought God loved the whole world. He does, but God hates sin. But you also have to remember in the New Testament that, well, Jesus said it this way. Remember this? He said, if you're going to follow me, he said, whoever doesn't hate their mother and father is not worthy of me. Now, Jesus wasn't telling us to break the Ten Commandments. The Ten Commandments, said to, one of the commandments, the fifth one, I think it is, right, so that you, you honor your mother and father. But several times in the New Testament, we use with that word is translated hate. It means they can't be first. You, you can't have the same love for your parents that you have for God's got to be first if God's going to be God. You can't have parents God. God's got to be first. There's a pecking order. So if you love God, Jesus used the word, and here it's used again, hate, it's second best. There's no word for love a little less, in other words. It's not the kind of hate you think of today when I'm going to kill you kind of hate, right? Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. I chose Jacob above Esau is literally what that means. Verse 14, just exactly what you were saying when I read that. Is there unrighteousness with God? And this is one of them things where Paul uses several times in Romans. He throws out a statement like that and then quickly says, God forbid there's no unrighteousness with God. God forbid, 15, for he says to Moses, he's going to try to explain this statement to us. God said back to Moses in Exodus, I guess, he said, I'll have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I will have compassion. This is in the Moses and Pharaoh story. I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. That's the sovereignty of God. And Paul's going to make the point, I believe, that it's unearned. That's what he's trying to make the point with this whole overall context of this thought pattern that the Jews had tried to earn favor with God by keeping the law, and they could not attain it. But the Gentiles found that they became the children of God by grace. God says, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy. I'll have uh, compassion on whom I'll have passion. But I've got good news for you today. God says, I'll have mercy on whom I'll have mercy, and I'll have compassion on whom I'll have compassion. But I can take the Bible as a whole, and I'll say, it is God's will to have compassion on everybody. That's not universalism. But that compassion or mercy has to be tapped into by believing the gospel and coming to the cross of Christ. How do you know that God wants to help save everybody? Because God said... I'm not willing that any should perish. Anybody goes to hell, they didn't go because it was God's will for them to go to hell. They went to hell because they rejected the only escape from hell, the cross of Christ. It cannot be earned. It can only be received by grace through faith. 16, so then it's not of him that wills, nor of him that runneth, but of God that shows mercy. Well, it was my will that I wanted to be saved, right? Well, yes and no. (laughs) 
it was God's will to save you, and you had to say yes. So, yeah, your will plays into it there, doesn't it? It's when your will aligns up with God's will that you can be saved. But it was God's will for you to be saved, God's will to show mercy upon you. You just said, I know, Lord, I can't attain it. I have to receive it. For the scripture says to Pharaoh, now, see, God didn't fail, even raising up Pharaoh. As hard-hearted and mean as Pharaoh was, wanted to wipe out and put God's people in, in bondage, Paul, God says, I've got a purpose in Pharaoh. <laughs> even for this same purpose have I raised Pharaoh up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. It still is. We read about that Pharaoh story today. And in Pharaoh's day, don't you know them other nations around was talking about what Israel's God had done to Egypt. I can back that up with Bible, by the way. When they got to Jericho, that's what Rahab said and her people. We've heard of y'all been coming across this. We heard what God did to Egypt. Therefore he hath mercy on whom he have mercy, and whom he hardens, he hardens. God has mercy on who he will, and he, and he hardens whom he hardens. That's what he said about Pharaoh every time, right? Now, you got to look at this. Say, remember when God sent Moses to Pharaoh? Let my people go. 80-year-old man with a stick came in for the greatest superpower on the, on the planet. <laughs> God says, let my people go. And Pharaoh was like, who is this God? Who do you think you are? And 10 times, God kept sending him to Pharaoh. Now, that's grace right there. Every time, right? God kept sending him back. But every time Pharaoh rejected the message of God, what happened? The Bible says, and his heart was hardened. It got harder every time he rejected, right? I still think it works that way. I think that every time somebody hears the gospel and they're convicted by the Holy Ghost of God and they continue to say no, the conviction gets a little bit less. That's why the Lord says, now's the time that today's the day of salvation. So God will have mercy on whom he have mercy, and he hardens who he hardens. Now, here, here I've got good news for you that, though. If that concerns you, that God hardens whom he hardens, your only reason you got concern is because the Holy Ghost of God gives you concern. The devil never gave you any concern about your soul or any of the things of God. He don't want you to have any concern. Verse 19. Paul thinking, what's people going to say when, I, when they read this? So he's trying to throw these things out. Maybe somebody will say, well, uh, thou wilt save me then. Why does he yet find fault? Who's resisted his will if God's sovereign in control of everything? Nay, but, O oh man, who art thou that replies against God? Shall the thing formed say unto him that formed it, Why hast thou made me thus? Now, I'm getting ahead again, but Paul's going to give us that to... I believe it's come from Isaiah originally, but I, I've watched them too. You have to need to watch them. The potter working with the clay, making a vase or a vase. <laughs> and it gets up to a certain point and it ain't just like the, it wants it to be. And it just smushes it all and starts doing it again. We even sing a song, right? Thou art the potter, we're the clay. So Paul said, well, wouldn't that be uh, something if the, pot, if, the, if, the, if the vase said, why do you make me like this? <laughs> Or it'd be even something more if the if the creature, the human being, said, God, you made me like this. What'd you make me like this for? Shall the thing that is formed say to him that formed it, Why did you make me this way? I'm a boy. Why'd you put me in a girl's body? <laughs> That's what they say today, right? I'm a girl. What am I doing in a boy's body? Shall the thing form say to him that formed it, why did you make see that's what that's all about. See, that's the devil's behind that stuff. Because in saying that, you're saying, God, you made a mistake. And God didn't make any mistakes. You get your thinking all messed up, and you think, I've got to change my body to fit my thinking. And no, you need to go get some counsel and get your thinking straightened out. That's all it is to it. And they don't mutilate you and butcher you up and do all this kind of thing. But we've come to this crazy period in history where you just say what you are, and it speaks it into existence. Everybody's got to bow down and say, I am that. Okay, we agree. I'm not that stupid. I'm going to go with the book. <laughs> the whole rest of the society can do that, but I'm going to die on the book. Amen? Amen. So 
If it were that easy, I'm 61 years old. I've still got, what, three and a half years before I can get Medicare. I'm looking for Medicare, you know. But I was saying, I'm just going to identify as 65. Give me my Medicare. <laughs> I guess you can be, they've got kids identifying as cats. And the school's got to respect that. You tell me we ain't in the last days. I mean, it's just crazy stuff going on. <laughs> In a day of illusions and utter confusion, upon their delusions, they come to their conclusions. <laughs> Why hast thou made me this? God, you, what have you done to me? And he says, verse 20, has not the potter power over the clay? <laughs> it's something the clay just don't ask. Of the same lump, he can make one vessel unto honor, he can make another unto dishonor. <laughs> what if... What if God, willing to show his wrath and to make his power known, endured with much long... So there's mercy even in this. God put up with Pharaoh a long time, gave him chance after chance. You can't say Pharaoh didn't have a chance. But God endured with much long suffering the vessels of wrath fitted to destruction. Now, remember the overarching umbrella of this few chapters is he's talking about not individuals as much as the nation of Israel and the rest of the world. And he's got all these people in, in the nation of Israel that think they're all right because I, my ancestry goes back to Abraham and the Jews of that day thought everybody else was the vessels of destruction. In fact, that's what they said. We've got writings from the first century where the Jews said to the Gentiles, the only reason God made the Gentiles was to fuel the fires of hell. <laughs> now Paul's turning the argument right around. You're the tree branches that have been broken off when you rejected Christ, and you're a vessel fitted for destruction. And, and you know, I think all of us that came to Christ at some point in our life can say, you know what, at one time I was a vessel fitted for destruction. But Jesus came into my life and made me a vessel of honor. That's how it works. So these people that Paul was writing this to in that day still had hope, and I hope some of them got right with God, don't you? hope all of them did, but hopefully some of them did, to be realistic. And that he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy. When, the, when the, that scene you see from the book of Revelation occurs in heaven, and we all stand in there shoulder and shoulder 10,000 times 10,000 and thousands and thousands before the Lamb of God singing our praises. That's going to show the glory of God. And somebody says in heaven in the book of Revelation, Sir, where did these come from? You know us. They came out of that mess down there. Came out of great tribulation. That he might make known the riches of his glory on the vessels of mercy which he had afore prepared unto glory from the foundation of the world. Even us whom he hath called, not of the Jews only, but also of the Gentiles. Jewish people, don't rest in your genealogy because we're all the same tree grafted together in Jesus Christ. Believers and unbelievers is the two groups. As he also said in O.C., that's Hosea, I think, and he's going to quote from it here. says, I, I will call them my people which were not my people and her beloved which was not beloved. Now, there's little snippets all through the Old Testament, just little verses like this, that if you were really a student of the word, as the Jews should have been by the first century, they, they were, but they couldn't see the, the trees for the forest in one sense. But all through there, there's things like, like the announcement in Isaiah, the Christmas verse even, about Jesus, that the Messiah, he, he will be a light to the Gentiles. It's like they just read over that. And, and here it is, there's, there's like a dozen or more of them and here's one out of Hosea that Paul just brings out and preaches on here. It says, uh, uh, I will call them my people, God says, which were not my people. There's all these little glimpses that in God's big picture in the fullness of time, the Gentiles were coming in. And her beloved, which was not beloved. 
And it shall come to pass that in the place where it was said unto them, You are not my people, there shall they be called the children of the living God. He's writing to a bunch of Jewish people saying, You shouldn't be surprised that the church is made up of Gentiles. You had it in your Jewish scriptures all those hundreds and hundreds of years. Another place that comes to my mind says, a pe- this is probably what Paul's drawing on here, a people which were not my people will be my people. Gentiles coming in. Isaiah, verse 27, also cries concerning Israel. Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, that was a promise to Abraham, they'll be like the stars of the sky and the sand of the sea, the descendants of Abraham. He was, God was telling him that before the first one, Isaac, was ever born, wasn't he? Though the number of the children of Israel be as the sand of the sea, a remnant shall be saved. Only a remnant of those Jews, but the children of Abraham were replaced by the Gentiles, the children of the promise. By faith we're, say, Father Abraham. We can say Father Abraham. For he will finish the work and cut it short in righteousness, Because a short work will the Lord make upon the earth. He's still doing it. And as Isaiah said before, except the Lord of the Sabbath had left us a seed, we had been as Sodom and made us and Gomorrah, just all gone. And he said, he's using this to say, Isaiah was prophesying about the Jews that there's only going to be a remnant of them believe. And except there was a seed, we'd be like Sodom and Gomorrah and all gone. Dad and I used to rabbit hunt when I was a kid with an old man named Richard Bowers. He'd been dead 20 years or more, I guess. He was kind of like Grandpa to me. He's quite a bit older than Dad. And we'd rabbit hunt. We had some good rabbit dogs. And hardly ever a rabbit would get away from us. But every once in a while, a rabbit would throw the dogs, and they never could pick it up again. And it stuck with me all my life. Old Richard, would, we'd call the go- dogs and, and head someplace else, you know, off that one. He said, you got to leave some for seed. Truth in that, ain't it? And that's what Paul's saying about what Isaiah said. There's some of his are going to be seed. <laughs> There'll be that remnant. If, if it got in the left of seed, it'd be like Sodom and Gomorrah. What shall we see then, say then that the Gentiles, now here's that verse, here's the important, to me, the heart of this scripture. What shall we say then, verse 30, that the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. That's the theme of the whole Bible, right? The just shall live by faith. That started back in the Old Testament. The Jews should have known that too. But Israel jumped the tracks about that. See, but Israel, verse 31, which followed not, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness. Israel gritted their teeth and tried to do it. If I dot every I and cross every T, I'll be, I'll be the people of God. And, and Paul said, you couldn't do it. You never attained unto righteousness because you should know enough about the law to realize that you fall so short, short of the law that what the law does, it says you're a sinner. But he went on like I'm kidding to do it and say, but that's good news because Christ died for sinners. But Israel thought if we could just be law keepers and obtain righteousness. And what that turned into, you find out by Luke chapter 15, it was a self-righteousness. Remember that guy went to the temple to pray, and I'm glad I'm not like them people over there. (laughs) I tithe, I fast, I do all this stuff. I'm glad I'm not like that old guy over there, that sinner. That was down on his knees saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said, that, that one is saying, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He's the one that went down justified. And I'll say the one that went in singing how great I am went out worse than he come in. <laughs> but that was the picture of Israel and the Gentiles that believed in Christ and the, Gent- the Jews that had rejected Christ. The Jews have been trying to do it. That's called in the New Testament, what? A doctrine of works. And the New Testament condemns that. Not that working for God's bad, but working for your salvation is bad. 
Don't ever see it that way. You're saved and created unto good works, but your good works ain't saving you. Only thing saves you by grace through faith. God will have mercy on whom we have mercy, and the ones he has mercy on are the ones that come to the cross of Christ and say, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. <laughs> That's worth reading again. I read it once. I'm going to read 30 and 31 again. What shall we say then that the Gentiles, which followed not after righteousness, they weren't even trying to attain righteousness, but they did attain it when they believed the gospel. They, they found the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, has not attained to the law of righteousness because they didn't seek it by faith. Which is what verse 32 says. Wherefore? Or to be Appalachian. How come? <laughs> because they sought it not by faith, but as it were by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone. Paul don't get far from the scriptures here. He brings another back in for us. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense. What is that stumbling stone? Well, Paul says, whoever believes on him, so we know the stumbling stone that they stumbled over was a him, the Lord Jesus Christ. <laughs> they stumbled over him and they rejected him. And that stone ground them to powder, to use another Old Testament scripture there. As it is written, Behold, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone and a rock of offense, and whoever believes on him shall not be ashamed. Lord, we thank you for our rock, the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us to believe more and more. In Jesus' name, amen.